preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Blair and I work here doing programming for the Charles Simon Center for Adult Life and Learning here at the Y. <clears throat> I'm very excited to see all of you here tonight. And I also want to let you know about some of the upcoming programs that we have planned for you. Anna Quinlan, Joe Klein, Al Franken, Mario Cuomo, Wesley Clark, Paul Berman, Koki Roberts, Pete Hamill, Klaus Schwab, Camille Paglia uh, are just a few of the people that we'll be presenting in the coming weeks. You can get more information about these programs on the web at www.92y.org or you can pick up a brochure on your way out. Tonight we'll be featuring the great thinkers, Norman Podhoritz and Ter Terry Teachout in conversation. There will be an op opportunity for you to ask questions. You can write them on the cards that you've been given and they'll be collected by the ushers. Mr. Podhoritz's new book, The Norman Podhoritz Reader, will be available for sale afterwards and he'll be available to sign and we'll also have copies of City Limits, Mr. Teachout's memoir. Terry Teachout is a music critic for Commentary Magazine and the drama critic for the Wall Street Journal. He writes a blog that you can find at terryteachout.com. And in May, Yale University Press will publish a Terry Teachout reader. Please welcome him out right now. Thank you. thinkers. He's the great thinker. I'm just the stooge tonight. The handy thing about introducing a man like Norman to a crowd like this is that I can be brief, so I will. If Norman hadn't written a word, he would still be remembered as one of the half dozen most consequential American magazine editors of the 20th century. Conversely, if Norman hadn't been the editor of commentary, he'd still be remembered as one of this country's most trenchant and compelling essayists. In both capacities, his range has been remarkable. He is, so far as I know, the only magazine editor to publish both Norman Mailer and Gene Kirkpatrick, <laughs> and the only essayist to have written about both Huckleberry Finn and Henry Kissinger. He has pitched his tent in the bloody crossroads and talked sense in both directions. We are here to celebrate the publication of the Norman Podoritz Reader, about which I will say only that it contains exactly the pieces I would have chosen had I edited it. Read it and you'll know, perhaps better than ever before, just what Norman has had to say about the world in the course of the last half century and why it matters. We will be spending the next hour or so talking about some of the pieces in the Podoritz Reader I should tell you that Norman didn't want to know what questions I planned to ask him this evening, and so he doesn't. And that said, it's time to bring on the headliner, the editor-at-large of Commentary, and the author of the Norman Podhortz Reader, Mr. Norman Podhortz. <laughs> Norman, I'll begin the proceedings by reading the first sentence of yours I ever read. It happens to be in my commonplace book, filed under the heading, Opening Lines, Great. One of the longest journeys in the world is the journey from Brooklyn to Manhattan, or at least from certain neighborhoods in Brooklyn to certain parts of Manhattan. That, of course, is the first sentence of Making It, Norman's 1967 memoir, which tells the story of how a Jewish street kid became a New York intellectual and a card-carrying member of America's upper middle class. Making it is a book with a strong ethnic feel, and yet when I read it as a small town Midwestern wasp trying to decide what to do with the rest of his life, it resonated as powerfully with me as it did with any New Yorker, unfamiliar though the surface details might have been. I too responded to the themes of self-definition and self-transformation, which are the subject matter of making it, and which seem to me central to the American national experience, which leads me to ask, when you wrote Making It, Norman, did you feel that you were telling a story that was in some sense quintessentially American? Oh, yes. Uh, I was mistaken, uh, given the hostile reception that the book received. Uh, but um, 
I never thought of making it as an autobiography. I thought of it um, as uh, a species of what I rather inelegantly came to call auto case history, which is to say uh, I was using my own experience as a test case or a, an exemplification of what I took to be uh, the, some of the central uh, problems or themes in, in American culture. Uh, the, the ambition for success being the, the central one that I was exploring here. Uh, it, I said there, borrowing a uh, phrase from D.H. Lawrence, who had applied it to uh, the Victorian attitude to sex as the dirty little secret. <clears throat> it's become a great cliche. I'm responsible for putting it into circulation because nobody remembered it from Lawrence, and nobody remembers that I put it into circulation, so it's <laughs> doubly, doubly um, um, treated doubly unfairly. In any event, I said that um, sex was no longer a dirty little secret, to put it mildly, but the ambition for success had taken its place and uh, was, uh, was the breeder, just as sex had been among the Victorians, of hypocrisy and uh, evasion, dishonesty, well, uh, I didn't know the half of it because uh, I, was, uh, I was landed on very, very hard. Uh, but I still think, and certainly in retrospect, I think uh, more strongly than ever, given what's happened since, uh, what is it, 35 years nearly since I wrote, more than 35 years since I wrote Making It, that it does actually um, trace the process by which um, many, many, and maybe even all uh, immigrant groups um, have acculturated or tried to acculturate and the particular kinds of problems that, uh, uh, that they have faced. And it's a problem now that has a peculiar urgency and poignancy because uh, of the rise of uh, what is called uh, euphemistically multiculturalism, uh, a force that uh, that undermines the pressures that uh, someone of my generation and earlier were under to become real Americans, to learn English, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, identify with the, with the historic values of the country. It's interesting that you frame it in those terms, specifically immigrant terms, because I remember very vividly reading this book long before I came to New York, and feeling that in some way it was almost like a, a recipe book, not a set of instructions, but how to make a, it. a possible path to take, a way to structure a life. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, in a sense, of course, uh, growing up in a small town in Missouri, uh, you were what uh, uh, Lionel Trilling once described as the young man from the provinces, uh, a figure very familiar to uh, the 19th century French novel. And uh, coming from Brooklyn, I too was a young man from the provinces. That's really what the first sentence of that book uh, uh, is suggesting. So that, uh, uh, yeah, why not? I mean, the book, the book would apply to someone uh, like you, and I was hoping also that it would. I mean, I didn't mean that it was only restricted to, uh, to the question of, of acculturation of immigrants. Of course, you had to acculturate to New York. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's just, you just were an immigrant the, the mileage isn't the, the important factor. Right. The distance is measured another way. Elsewhere in the reader, you quote with evident approval these words by another writer. He had set himself a goal beyond human capacity to make himself over entirely, to create a new personality as if alone of all mankind he could overcome his destiny. That's Henry Kissinger talking about Richard Nixon. And it makes me wonder, do you think the theme of self-transformation is as important in American politics as it is in American art? <laughs> That's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, the answer is, is probably yes. Uh, the difference being that the process of self-transformation uh, that takes place in politics is, is usually uh, based on myth, fiction, uh, and outright deception. Uh, whereas uh, we, uh, ideally at least in art, uh, it uh, is based on the opposite uh, impulse, which is to, to tell the truth particularly the hidden truth. Um, you know, I mean, this is nothing new. Uh, Lincoln, our greatest president, and, uh, and a 
a transcendent human being, if there ever was one, uh, liked to talk of himself as the, you know, the boy from the log cabin splitting rails. Of course, that's not what he was, uh, really. And um, he was actually a, a quite prosperous railroad lawyer at the time. He was, you know, pretending to be a, a poor, well, sort of like the John Edwards of his time. Um, in that respect. In that respect, but only in that respect. <laughs> as to say, La Havdil, I would say, uh, may, it, may it not be confused. Um, so, um, but, and politicians uh, generally um, have to go through um, this really strenuous uh, exercise of pretending to be someone they're not, uh, and uh, which is one of the reasons uh, that um, authenticity in a political figure comes to seem such a rare and precious quality when we come upon it. Uh, I think, for example, it was the secret of the appeal of, of John McCain when he was running in the primaries against uh, George Bush. Did John Kennedy strike you as, as an authentic person or as a self-creation? Well, when Kennedy, once Kennedy became president, he relaxed, and uh, there was a, uh, there were parts of him that showed, uh, authentic parts of him that showed through, especially at press conferences. Uh, but um, of course, he was a self-creation. Uh, he was um, uh, he was someone who uh, uh, engaged in an enormous uh, pretense. I mean, for example, much uh, he was he was a, a suffered seriously from a serious illness and uh, was in pain a great deal. Um, he, uh, he was someone who uh, had not been especially ambitious for a big political career when he was younger. His older brother had been the designated hitter, uh, the, 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 uh, the designated uh, son for pursuing the presidency by their father. Uh, so, I, I mean, and Kennedy was a bit of a playboy uh, when he was young, and also, of course, when he was in the White House. He was a, a very compulsive womanizer. So, none of that was seen by the public, of course. The reader is organized in roughly chronological order, and in going through it, it reminds those of us who knew and may surprise some people who didn't know about the initial intensity of your involvement in literary criticism. Uh, most of the pieces I knew, some I didn't, uh, but I knew the piece about Saul Bellow that is included there. And in writing about Saul Bellow a half century ago, you said that most serious critics would single him out as the leading American novelist of the post-war period. One of the reasons for this, you added, was that, and I quote, Bellow is an intellectual, by which I do not only mean that he is intelligent, but also that his work exhibits a closer involvement with ideas than the work of most other writers in this period. Now, that sentence struck me when I first read it, because it had never before occurred to me that being an intellectual was necessarily a good thing for a novelist to be. With a half century of hindsight to build on, I want to ask you now, do you now feel that it is? And how do you think that Bellow's standing as an intellectual affected his work as an artist since then? Okay, well, uh, I'm glad you quoted that sentence because as I sat here listening to it, I thought, hmm, that kid wrote pretty well. <laughs> uh, he really did. <laughs> um, I, uh, I think that uh, uh, Saul Bellow uh, is, uh, uh, as a pro stylist, uh, a, one of the uh, prime virtuosos Virtuosi, virtuosi of the English language in our time. I think uh, he is uh, uh, enormously intelligent as well as being an intellectual. I have never thought, I didn't think when I wrote that essay, how many years ago was it? I don't know, 40, Not 50. Nearly 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. I didn't think when I wrote that essay that he had written any uh, novels that were successful as novels. Uh, and I still think he has never written any novels that have succeeded as novels. Some a little, uh, some some have uh, done a bit better than others in that regard. Uh, I think Bellow's books, uh, even the best of them, are dramatic monologues uh, in which uh, the characters uh, don't achieve an autonomous uh, existence. Um, 
sort of spring to life uh, outside the page, really, and into our imaginations. Uh, but they are all sort of aspects of Saul Bellow's own voice and, uh, uh, and, own, and own mind, which is multifarious, rich, complex. Uh, but that's not what a novelist does. A novelist, uh, a novelist creates a world uh, which, uh, as I said before, achieves an autonomous existence, um, which is independent of the, of the writer's own personality, uh, own character, own being, but rather like giving birth to a child, uh, really. Um, none of Bellow's books, I think, uh, uh, meets that criterion, uh, and, uh, which is not to say he isn't a wonderful writer, uh, he is, uh, but I think that uh, he was misled into a misuse of his own greatest gifts and misled by the cultural prestige of the novel when he was young. The uh, novel doesn't have the kind of prestige it had in those days. It was There was a kind of almost religious reverence for the form itself, very much like the attitude uh, in Victorian England toward poetry and also in the United States uh, in the late 19th century. One of my old teachers, the great critic F.R. Liebes, uh blamed the decline of poetry in the late 19th century in England as compared with its condition in the early 19th century to the veneration in which poetry was held. It, it, everyone was sort of burning incense uh, at that altar uh, and not writing the way they were writing uh, in, in the earlier part of the century, out of out of themselves and and uh, and uh, in a, with some f feel for the tradition of the language and the form, uh, something similar happened to the novel in the uh, in in the twentieth century. It became the holy grail. Everybody wanted to write the the great American novel, but if you were a writer and you did not write novels, you were regarded as second class or almost inferior. Uh, and I think many people, not just Bellow, uh, uh, I think of the young James Baldwin, um, who was a far better essayist than he was a novelist, but felt compelled, I, I stress the young James Baldwin, by the way. Uh, uh, but there are many other cases in which people tried to write fiction who would have been better off uh, writing discursive uh, prose of one kind or another. And uh, in fact, I think Bellow's single best book is a book called To Jerusalem and Back, which is a kind of journal of a, of a, of a stay, uh, of, his, uh, of a visit to Israel where he stayed for a few months. It's a wonderful book. You know, it, it's fascinating the idea that, that even though, and I agree with you about Bellow, even though he may have been working in the wrong medium, that he nevertheless has succeeded in imposing himself on on American awareness, even working under this disability. Well, I think that's a tribute to the power of his prose and the power of his intellect, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, your feeling when you were young that it might not be such so good to be an intellectual if you were a novelist was probably right. I mean, uh, you know, uh, 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 T.S. Eliot famously said that Henry James had a mind so fine that no idea could violate it. And uh, uh, people have often taken that to mean uh, that it was good not to be an intellectual if you were a novelist. Of course, James was uh, about as intelligent as, it's cap as a human being is capable of, of being. A but, man on whom nothing was lost. Uh, nothing was lost, and uh, every, if anything, too much was, uh, you know, he could have used a few losses, uh, actually. <laughs> uh, but, um, but the fact is that, um, uh, to uh, hark back to a category that was famous in the criticism of the 50s, uh, uh, a, uh, um, um, a distinction made by the late Philip Robb, who was then co-editor of Partisan Review, who talked about pale faces and redskins as making up the two streams in American literature, the pale faces being the, um, uh, the thinkers, basically the redskins being the tough guys. Hemingway was the sort of contemporary exemplar of the, of the redskin. Uh, Henry James was the supreme pale face. Uh, 
Uh, Bellow tried to bring the pale face and the red skin together. That was what he actually thought he had achieved in the, in the character of Augie March. In Which the, would have left him red-faced. <laughs> well, he was very red-faced with anger when he read my review of Augie March, I'll tell you that. Um, but I think, I think he, imp he has imposed himself uh, uh, legitimately because uh, even though uh, none of his novels I think is aesthetically satisfying as a novel, uh, he, they are powerful books and, uh, because he has a, got a powerful mind and is a wonderful writer. It is no secret to anybody in this room that you went through a radical phase in your youth. Now, I hadn't read your 1959 essay about Huckleberry Finn. The reader is actually the first time it appeared in book form. And the last paragraph caught my eye. You wrote, it might be a good idea to pass a law requiring social workers, guidance counselors, and all the members of certain schools of psychoanalysis to read Huckleberry Finn at least once a year. There is no telling what might happen if the proponents of adjustment were forced into periodic contemplation of a character who is more civilized than his mentors and more mature than his elders precisely by virtue of his refusal to submit to their notion of what is necessary, natural, and real. Mm -hmm. Now, I too think that would be a good idea, but for different reasons. And I suspect that your own reasons have changed somewhat since 1959. Was that the voice of the radical Norman Potteritz we oh, just yeah. heard? Oh, definitely. And uh, oh, yes. how far <laughs> removed from his point of view is the gentleman sitting on the platform with me? Well, uh, rather less than you might think, uh, because that range of issues is uh, still very much alive in my own uh, in my own mind, what what I was getting at there, uh, I, I mean, I came to a, a radical position not so much via politics in the narrow sense, but uh, uh, through um, through a preoccupation with issues like like uh, the one I raised in connection with Huck Finn, and um, in general with the con what the sort of the spiritual social condition of American life. Uh, much more than American politics. In fact, most of us uh, uh, in the intellectual community in those days were contemptuous of, of uh, partisan politics. People used to say, you know, there's the, uh, Republicans and Democrats, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, and Dwight McDonald, uh, one of the New York intellectuals who was not Jewish, um, uh, amended that to, uh, as uh, Tweedledum and Tweedledumer. Uh, that pretty well uh, uh, described the attitude that prevailed in the New York intellectual community toward partisan politics. Uh, so I wasn't all that interested in partisan politics. I was interested in the, in, in the world of ideas and ideologies. And um, uh, my own uh, move to the left, which took place in the late 60s from a from a liberal position. I mean, I moved left from liberalism, and uh, my own move to the left uh, had a lot to do with the uh, feeling I had that, uh, that there was uh, a kind of dullness had settled over American culture, and that the sources of this dullness uh, had to do with uh, some of those categories I was being snide about, uh, the, uh, the demand that we be mature and, and adjusted, uh, and uh, and the notion, uh, the assumption uh, that uh, the uh, the reality to which we had to adjust and with respect to which we had to uh, strive for maturity was uh, more or less perfect, or at least as good as it could be, and uh, therefore any rebellion against it was a sign of uh, neurosis. Uh, use the word that was common in those days, uh, and uh, that. Um, in general, there was something wrong with people who were not uh, who were not uh, in tune with uh, with the prevailing values and prevailing modes of life. Now, I think that idea did an enormous amount of harm in the following ten years. And the reason I myself later to cite a book you'll probably ask me about, Breaking Ranks. The reason I broke ranks was that I grew to be horrified by the consequences of ideas like the ones I was espousing as a writer and promoting as an editor. 
Um, but I, uh, so and to that extent, I, I feel very far removed from, um, from uh, the young man who wrote that paragraph. On the other hand, speaking uh, as a literary critic, I think I was right about Mark Twain's attitude. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think I was, you know, I mean, I don't agree with Mark Twain's attitude any longer, but I, I think my reading of Huck Finn was was uh, was accurate uh, as a uh, as an analysis of what Twain was trying to say through uh, the uh, the picture of of, um, of Huck on the raft with Nigger Jim. Um, you know, there are people who try to censor, who have actually censored that novel um, because of a passage which I describe in that little essay as one of the sublime moments in all literature. And I think it is when, uh, when uh, uh, Huck uh, thinks that, uh, decides he's got to, uh, got to return uh, Jim, who's of course a, a slave who's run away from this old woman. Uh, and he's got to return it to him because she, he, she never done me no harm, he says. And he gets all worked up and, uh, and feels guilty about the harm he has done to this slave-holding old woman by uh, harboring uh, her runaway slave uh, who's become his friend on the raft. And then finally he thinks and he thinks and he thinks and finally, as you may remember, he says to himself, well, okay, I'll go to hell, yeah. but I'm not going to give him back. Uh, but he's convinced that by making that decision, he has damned himself. You see, it, it's an and I, I mean, I get the chills even t telling about it, much less reading it. And I, when I read that uh, people have banned Huck Finn from libraries in certain parts of the country, and that um, because the word nigger is there and they've misread this particular passage, it, it appalls me. When you give that reading, it makes it sound almost like Graham Greene, you know, someone oh, who, who concludes Green. it's better to be to be right and be damned. Well, okay, Graham Greene is not in Mark Twain's class. <laughs> it's hard for people of my generation to imagine a radicalism that is cultural but not political. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, if the fact that this was the form of radicalism that came naturally to you arose from the anti-communist experience for you. Not really, and that's a further complication. I mean, I was an anti-communist even when I was a radical, which made me a very anomalous radical in the 60s, I can tell you. But uh, that's a, a whole other story. Uh, the, the fact is that cultural radicalism uh, took the lead in the, uh, the so-called movement, capital M, of the 60s. I mean, you had two wings, two arms. One was called the counterculture, which was cultural radicalism, and it w went counter to the culture and uh, to the prevailing culture, or the establishment culture, as it was called. The other was the new left, which was focused largely on, on, on political action and protest. And there was a, something of an antagonism between these two branches of the movement to begin with. Uh, the uh, m many uh, members of the early New Left were uh, fairly puritanical, as radicals had often been in the past, and uh, were worried about the uh, the uh, looseness and the you know the sort of the sexual freedom and uh, and drugs and uh, hanging loose that was being that were being practiced and advocated by the members of the countercultural arm of the movement. But eventually, the two streams merged, and and there was a more or less happy marriage. Uh, but the um, uh, the underlying uh, uh, power, uh, the motive, the driving force of that radicalism, I, th I think, was more cultural and political uh, even then. And, and now, uh, well, what they now call the social issues, um, uh, you know, uh, abortion, uh, prayer in the schools, uh, whatever else comes up now, gay, gay marriage, uh, these are all uh, cultural rather than rather than uh, uh, political issues. They get politicized because they're sub submitted to legislatures or judges, but in, in, in essence, they are much more cultural or social than political. Now. You're skipping? Uh, we're skipping ahead yeah, okay. a little because, <laughs> because you've brought us to some place that I want to talk about. 
In your 1996 eulogy for neoconservatism, you said that revulsion against the counterculture accounted for more converts to neoconservatism than any other single factor. Yeah. And I agree with you. But it strikes me that to speak of a counterculture today sounds almost quaint, you now that the counterculture of the 60s in some ways has essentially replaced the old liberal establishment. Mm -hmm. Do you think things have gone that far, or do you think I'm exaggerating? No, I don't think you're exaggerating. I, I think to be countercultural today is to be conservative. Uh, because the dominant culture today uh, is uh, is is leftist and even rad I mean not just liberal but radical in, in many of its uh, aspects when I say the culture I mean the usual suspects I mean the universities the major centers of, of, of information and entertainment. Uh, I mean the, uh, the intellectual world in general with you know, a few exceptions. Um, these are all now uh, redoubts uh, of, um, of the left and the conventional wisdom uh, nowadays uh, is, uh, if you're gonna talk about an, you know, an established culture and a conventional wisdom, uh, it's determined by that world, by that world of the radical left. Uh, uh, I think even more powerfully than the liberal establishment uh, of the late 50s dominated uh, in its day. Incidentally, uh, what a lot of people still don't know or understand or remember is that the main enemy of the radical left of the late 50s and early 60s was not the right wing. The right wing hardly existed, uh, was off the radar. It was the liberal establishment. That was the enemy, uh, interestingly. And one of the ironies is that the, uh, the radicals captured the, uh, the, 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 the term liberal and transformed, uh, well, you might say, the epistemological perception of, of, of the alignments in American politics. Let's return to the long march through the, the institution of your okay. work just for a moment. There's one more thing I want to ask you about your early interest in the novel. And it, it, it arises from another one of the uncollected pieces in the reader, which is called After Modernism, What? Mm. You wrote it in 1974 when you yourself were in the process of embarking on a great personal and intellectual sea change. And in this piece, you made a prediction about the future of the novel. You said it would return to something like realism. This is what you actually said. My own guess is that imaginative literature will once again offer itself as the means by which the perennially insistent hunger for showing us how we live and what we are like can best be satisfied. I think this will happen because the logic of literary history points toward it. There is no other way for literature to go except perhaps to the grave. A quarter century of postmodernism, not just in fiction but in all the arts, separates us from that prediction. How does it strike you now? Well, it was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was wrong, alas. Um, I, think, I think we all might have been better off if the prediction had turned out to be right. Um, you know, again, this is difficult to describe, I find, to younger people. Uh, when I was um, in my 20s, uh, early 30s, and earlier than that, the passion uh, that, was, uh, that was invested in literature, including contemporary literature, was, uh, had a kind of intensity and seriousness that no longer exists. You see it in politics now. Uh, but, I mean, people did almost literally, in fact, literally in some cases that I saw, come to blows uh, over whether The Adventures of Orgy March was a great novel or not. Um, and uh, With you. With me. <laughs> uh, well, I tell a story. Uh, it's a good story. It's worth telling again. About, I was, I don't know, 23, 24 years old, and I was at one of the first big New York, glamorous New York literary parties I had ever attended. And there were many people there who were great celebrities to me. They were, of course, writers and uh, poets and critics. And I was getting a drink. Everybody drank a lot in those days. Um, and uh, I, was, I was getting a drink, and this guy, 
stumbled over to me. Uh, he was very, very drunk. He could hardly walk. And he said, uh, we'll get you for that review if it takes 10 years. And he meant my review I had just published of The Adventures of Augie March, in which I was very critical of it. And I said, who are you? And he said, John Berriman. Uh, John Berriman was then considered, along with Robert Lowell, uh, you know, the one of the two great contemporary American poets. He was a very big figure to me. And I didn't know, I mean, I was half flattered by, uh, you know, the fact that I had caught John Berryman's attention and half appalled by this uh, threat, which, uh, by the way, more or less was made good. Um, but <laughs> um, but it, it, it gives you a sense of how strongly people felt uh, about literature, and uh, this pretty well dissipated in the 1960s when everything got to be politicized, and uh, and uh, I think that uh, the uh, contemporary literature has not recovered from the blow it sustained uh, in the uh, in the 60s and and uh, up through the mid 70s when I when I wrote that article when. I was actually writing that article as a polemic against certain highly distinguished intellectuals, including Norman O. Brown and Susan Sontag and a few others, who had said that that it was bad for you to read. Books were bad for you, and they were. And one famous feminist said, "Novels or poems are counter-revolutionary." Therefore, stay away. Um, well, Lenin had uh, once actually said that uh, he, he didn't want to listen to music because listening to the Beethoven, the Kreutzer Sonata, made him soft. Right. And presumably, couldn't go out and kill enough people the next day because of Beethoven. Um, in any event, I was um, trying to make a case for literature in that piece and. Uh, and saying some of the things that had gone wrong with it and hoping it would return to what I took to be its fundamental mission. Uh, and uh, I don't think it has returned to that mission. And I think that the loss of uh, interest, uh, relatively speaking, in literature, particularly in the novel um, today, is uh, in large measure due to its failure to have fulfilled that that prediction. Right. and. Um, Partly due to the fact, and its inability to re to return uh, fulfill that prediction had, in some measure, to do with the uh, with what happened, uh, the politicization of everything in the in the 60s and and uh, and 70s. And of course, your own your own interest, or maybe it would be better said, your own attention, as a writer, shifted too as you embarked on the process of what you've described as de-radicalization. Yeah, well, I, w I was politicized also, by the way. I mean, I was among the everything that was politicized. Sure. You mentioned Breaking Ranks, a book which might just as well have been called Unmaking It. <laughs> and you speak there of the story of how and why you went from being a liberal to being a radical, and then finally to being an enemy of radicalism in all its forms and varieties. And you went on to suggest that self-hatred and self-contempt were at the root of American radicalism. I want to ask you, were these very powerful emotions implicated in your own involvement with radicalism? And if they were, how did you overcome them? Hmm. Well, oddly enough, I don't think they were. I mean, maybe I'm kidding myself. But I, uh, as I said before, being a com anti-communist when I was a, a radical made me anomalous even uh, then. But the other thing that made me anomalous was that I uh, that I always loved this country. Now that sounds like a fatuous banality, but uh, not to me. Well, okay. I mean, but um, nowadays everybody's parading patriotism, not everybody, but what I mean by that is that um, the, uh, the reason that, that this had some bite to it uh, is that the radicalism of the 1960s, unlike the radicalism of the 1930s from which to, to, it's, to some extent descended, um, did not have a positive model in mind for what the revolution would bring. In the 30s, uh, people dreamed of uh, 
a Soviet America. I mean, uh, the model was the Soviet Union. The radical uh, for for most radicals, uh, I remember a, a a piquant example of this in an early issue of Partisan Review when it was still a communist magazine, early thirties. Uh, there was a writer named Tilly Lerner, uh, uh, or it became Tilly Olson, and she was quite a good writer. And um, they, she, they published a story by her, and the author's note said, uh, Tilly Lerner, or maybe it was Tilly Olson at that point, has taken a leave from uh, whatever union it was uh, to produce a citizen, a future citizen of Soviet America, <laughs> and uh, that that. It gives you a pretty good idea of, of what I would call, uh, despite all its faults, and they were many, the, 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 the positive uh, character of 30s radicalism. 60s radicalism had no such positive model in mind. Uh, it, was, it, it was based uh, entirely on a negative model, which was the United States. Uh, everything about the United States was bad. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, the definition of good was uh, something that was not American. Uh, enemies of America were to be supported uh, because by virtue of being enemies of America, uh, America was the, was the, uh, was the, uh, the um, glass of, uh, of bad fashion and the mold of, uh, of evil form. Uh, America to, with a K. Um, yes. And America was spelled with a K to associate it with Nazi Germany. So to be a radical, to be a member of that community, which I was in very good standing and considered to be, um, uh, and yet to uh, continue to, as I, well, I wrote a book a few years ago called My Love Affair with America. And I described that period as uh, a slightly rough patch in my love affair with America, but um, it can, but the marriage didn't break up, and I continue to love this country. I always have. I still do, and uh, that too made me uh, something of an anomaly. Uh, so I mean, to the extent that, uh, uh, nor did I. I mean, so the extent that 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 there was American self hatred in the radical movement, I didn't suffer from it. Uh, I don't think I suffered from Jewish self-hatred, which was which was prominent uh, among the the Jewish members of that movement, who were numerous, uh, and um, there was and there were other forms of it. I mean, people didn't want to be what they were, whatever they were, and uh, so I guess my radicalism was, as uh, D. H. Lawrence might have said, you know, uh, you talked about sex in the head. Maybe mine was a radicalism in the head and not in the heart. Uh, in any event, I found myself getting more and more repelled by what was going on around me in the radical movement, and mainly the attitude toward America, which as it became more and more virulent, I became more and more unhappy and disaffected, because it had practical consequences, this hatred of America. It meant you celebrated the taking of drugs because it was anti-establishment, as it were. Uh, it, uh, it, it was supposedly uh, everybody who was, quotes, normal, uh, just the opposite of what I was saying in that Huck Finn thing, everybody who was, quotes, normal was regarded as crazy, and everybody who seemed to be crazy was, uh, was uh, expressing a higher sanity by virtue of being, of being um, uh, at odds with, this, with the reality of this society. Uh, and drugs were a part of that, the, and the, the, very, the very romanticization of insanity uh, and of criminality, for example, especially black criminality. What Kenneth Rexroth, uh, a radical poet in, the, uh, in San Francisco, one of the early patrons of the beat uh, poets, called Crow Jimism, by which he meant the the uh, you know the opposite of Jim Crow, the romanticization of of, uh, of uh, Negro life, as Negro was the word those days, of course. Yeah. So anyway, I think the I think the answer is on the whole no. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Johnson contributed an introduction to the reader in which he contrasted what might be called social attitudes toward ideas in England and America. And he talked about how your move to the right had cost you a great many friends. 
He said, we do things differently in England. We try not to let ideological disagreements disturb our social life or the ecumenical serenity of our clubs. Politics, let alone ideas, are not that important. We think people should come before ideas. It is our strength as well, some would say, as our weakness. When I read those words, I thought immediately of the end of the chapter about Norman Mailer in your book, Ex Friends, where you describe how you declined an overture of friendship from Mailer long after the two of you had broken. And you said this, I had no wish to put myself in the false position of participating in the celebration of a career that had so bitterly disappointed my literary expectations. Besides, having spent the last 30 years and more trying to make up for and undo the damage I did in cooperation with Mailer and so many other of my ex-friends, both living and dead, I simply could see no way back to him or to them ever again. And that passage sums up the difference between Paul Johnson's world and yours as fully as possible. But I find it memorable for another reason. You are here speaking the language of guilt and penance, or am I putting it too strongly? No, no, I mean, I think I did do a lot of harm. Well, you know, St. Augustine, if I may quote the Catholic saint in these uh, halls, um, uh, once said, the virtue of children resides not in their wills, but in the weakness of their limbs. In other words, the harm that they do is limited by their power, uh, by their powerlessness. And I think I feel the same way about a lot of my ex-friends. I mean, uh, the uh, uh, they would have done, and so would I, uh, much more harm than we than we did if we had had more power. And uh, I, uh, I mean, when I broke. Uh, Pretty decisive, pretty decisively with the left. Uh, I, I had been hard as it may be for many of you to believe this. Uh, I'd been very popular and much liked in those circles, and a lot of people were trying to find some excuse for what had happened to me, and some thought I had gone nuts. I mean, the usual explanation for someone who breaks with the left and moves right is that he's quote selling out for power, for money, for whatever. But everybody who knew me knew that I was doing myself, my career, a great deal of harm. So it was clear I wasn't selling out. Um, although later there was a revisionist view. It seemed that I had anticipated the rise in 10 or 15 years of Ronald Reagan, and therefore I was preemptively selling out, you see. <laughs> Is that like uh, but, premature anti-fascism? Uh, well, it's or it's like preemptively, like the Bush doctrine. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I uh, but a, a friend of a dear friend of ours and a, a man who actually loved me um, and uh, w went to my wife. I mean, one of the theories is that I didn't sell out. Some people thought I just gone nuts and. Uh, uh, it never occurred to anybody that I could have changed my mind in good faith and so on. So I'd gone nuts. And this friend, very brilliant man by the way, uh, went to my wife and suggested in all seriousness that I be committed to a mental institution because I was being so self-destructive that the next step would be literal self-destruction, that is suicide, and I had to be prevented from committing suicide. Uh, now, I, I, ever since that happened, I've better understood um, the use of psychiatric uh, punishment in the Soviet Union. I mean, my friend Vladimir Bukovsky uh, was sent to a mental institution. Um, he was better than being shot, but he was, uh, because he, being a dissident in the Soviet Union, was diagnosed as a, as a mental illness literally and they had uh, this was part of the doctrine of soviet psychiatry well i i think that if my some of my ex-friends had been in power i actually would have been sent to a mental asylum and so would you know a lot of other people uh if not worse uh, so um i do feel guilt uh, i mean i i don't want to exaggerate the uh, the um, the harm uh, we did but it was i think quite considerable ruined a lot of young lives. Uh, the, the influence of some of our ideas uh, uh, did ruin a lot of young lives, including some I knew about, friends of my own children. Uh, and um, I think uh, injected a kind of poison into the, into the uh, political atmosphere of this country that is still there. In fact, in some ways has grown worse. 
Um, and I, uh, I do feel, I did feel a, uh, an obligation to, to uh, undo as much of that damage as I possibly could. And I have, in fact, devoted, it's now more than 30 years, uh, to, uh, to um, that enterprise and undertaking. And um, the, 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 the trouble is, the trouble, the blessing, I don't know. Um, John Maynard Keynes um, once said, I think the best thing he ever said, was that most um, businessmen who imagine that they uh, are not interested in ideas uh, always turn out to be the slaves of some defunct economist the slaves of some defunct economist. Now, I think most people, including people who are indifferent to ideas, uh, and that's most people. Uh, most people are not, don't care that much. Uh, and that's good, in my opinion. It's fine. It's okay. Um, but the f fact of the matter is that almost everybody is the slave of some set of ideas or other. Uh, well, slave is, is, is not right, the right word, but, but our lives are, are determined to a very great extent by ideas. Um, you know, I mean, how are you supposed to live your life? How do you raise your kids? What do you, you know, what do you do about discipline? What do you do about this? How do you get married? You don't get married. You get divorced. You don't get divorced. So on and so forth. Uh, all of these uh, issues um, are, um, are decided on the basis of uh, sometimes half-remembered ideas or ideas that are in circulation. So ideas are indeed very, very powerful. I believe they're the most powerful of all forces. And people who deal in ideas therefore have, uh, well, I mean, Shelley was not altogether wrong. I mean, it said that the poets were unacknowledged legislators of the world because that, doesn't satisfy most poets I've known. They want to be acknowledged legislators of the world. <laughs> but the fact is that, um, that uh, there is this power to shape uh, life, the life around one. Uh, and uh, if it's misused, as I believe it has largely been by American, uh, well, Western intellectuals generally in my lifetime, um, uh, great harm will, will, will come of it. And great harm has come of it. Yeah. Before we turn to the questions of the audience, there's one more thing I would like to ask you about. Good. Last night, I went to the press preview of the Broadway revival of Fiddler on the Roof. It's at the Minskoff Theater, which is a very big house. But when the Russian constable, a Jewish dog, there was a silence in the theater so entire and profound that I could barely draw my next breath. Before the play, I've been thinking about our conversation tonight. And in that silence, I thought of these words from Jacques Hughes, your 1982 essay about Israel and anti-Semitism. You wrote, in the past, anti-Semitism has been a barometer of the health of democratic societies, rising in times of social or national despair, falling in periods of self-confidence. It is the same today with attitudes toward Israel. Hostility toward Israel is a sure sign of failing faith in and support for the virtues and values of Western civilization in general and of America in particular. And I want to ask you, how stands that barometer in 2004, mm. three years after 9-11? Well, unlike, <clears throat> unlike some of my literary predictions, I think the, the, um, the ones I made in Jacques have unfortunately uh, turned out to be accurate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the the Jacques was written about the response to the uh, Israeli incursion into Lebanon in 1982. Read that essay again, as I was forced to do when reading the proofs of this uh, of the reader. Uh, you will see, I think, as I did, and I was quite taken aback, if you change a few of the names and the places, uh, you, the piece could be written almost word for word today. Um, um, and the eruption of, uh, of, of anti-Semitism uh, in response to the Israeli incursion into Lebanon, uh, anti-Semitism now mostly disguising itself as anti-Zionism or criticism of the policies of Israel. Um, 
has metastasized by now and become uh, much more widespread and much more threatening than it was then. And uh, there's no question that um, it's, it's, a, it's a serious problem. I never thought I would live uh, to see people reasonably comparing uh, uh, the world around them to the 30s and the, the conditions out of which uh, uh, Nazism arose. I mean, there's Nazi anti-Semitism arose. Um, people in Europe are saying this and have some reason for saying it. Is the, uh, um, the hatred and hostility toward Israel uh, has become a mutation of traditional anti-Semitism. Israel is to the nations as the Jews were uh, to the, the countries in which they lived. In other words, Israel is the Jew of the nations. And all the traditional anti-Semitic charges that were directed at Jews in the diaspora are now translated into the idiom of international affairs and directed at the Jewish state. Um, and there's also been a spillover uh, so that uh, there's just out and out frank old-fashioned anti-semitism being uh, uh, being directed at the uh, Jews in countries like uh, France and uh, Germany and S S Sweden uh, <coughs> and uh, Britain some of it spread by uh, by um, uh, Muslims who've uh, emigrated to the West but much of it spread by uh, by uh, the intelligentsia, by intellectuals, uh, who uh, for the most part in, in Europe uh, are violently anti-Israel and many of whom are quite openly anti-Semitic. That includes a few Jews among them, like Harold Pinter. Um, as my mother would have said, him we needed also. <laughs> that sounds like something Chevia would have said. <laughs> So uh, how stands it? It stands, it stands in a parlous condition, and it's something to worry about. What is its prospect, do you think? Well, I actually think that uh, the United States is now, under G George Bush, is engaged in a, um, in a historic and, I would say, noble enterprise, which is to reshape the um, region, the middle, the entire Middle East, a region that was created not by Allah in the seventh century, but by British and French diplomats after the First World War. And now after the, uh, what some of us think of as the Third World War, that is the Cold War, uh, an effort is being made to reshape that, to undo some of the damage that those diplomats did by planting despotisms uh, in, in all over that part of the world. And th those despotisms have finally uh, bred a uh, species of terrorists to threaten us and threaten the entire civilization of which we are the, uh, the leader. Uh, the, uh, uh, Israel is uh, very much on the front line of this war. It was not undertaken, as some anti-Semites have said, for the sake of Israel. Uh, but uh, uh, Israel is nevertheless uh, vitally implicated, um, inescapably. And um, the prospects for Israel itself, and I think for uh, anti-Semitism in general uh, outside Israel, depend heavily on the success of what the United States has begun to do uh, since 9-11. Uh, we have to bear in mind that uh, this is the second scene uh, of the first act of a five-act play, which is likely to last for 40 or 50 years, just as the Cold War did. Uh, there's a great deal of impatience about uh, what's uh, about the situation. I think enormous progress has been made. I'm actually optimistic about the prospects, as long as we keep our nerve and hold steady. <clears throat> and I think uh, uh, not just uh, the fate of the Jews or uh, of Israel uh, uh, hangs uh, to a great extent on the success of this enterprise, but I think the fate of the United States and of the civilized world as a whole. And uh, theref there therefore I hope and pray, although I doubt I'll live to see this, uh, this war brought to a successful conclusion, I hope and pray that it will be.
And before we go to the questions, there is one last thing you have made me think of just in that last moment. I asked you this once uh, privately, and I'd like you to answer this for the audience as well. You talk about a war that you won't perhaps live to see the end of. Did you think you would live to see the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall? How did it feel to you? No, I did not think I would live to see the end of it, although I have to say in my own uh, defense, as it were, that I believed that it would come to a successful end if the right policies were pursued. I mean, I always took the position that um, there was no reason to assume that the Soviet empire, unlike all other empires in history, was eternal and that we had to make our accommodation with it and help it to stabilize itself. I thought we <clears throat> should work actively to destabilize it, uh, which is in effect what we on the whole did. And, 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 but I never dreamed that it would happen as quickly as it did. Um, and how it felt was, uh, well, I mean, I for one was uh, exhilarated, amazed, um, uh, grateful. I think it was one of the one of the one of the transcendent moments of uh, of human history, uh, the liberation uh, of a huge part of the world from one of the worst, most monstrous totalitarian tyrannies uh, that had ever existed. It was, a, and I think it's a spiritual sin um, in the West that it has not been celebrated to the extent that I think it should be, should have been, and should continue to be. Bliss it was in that dawn to be alive. Well, uh, yes, and to be young, uh, to conclude that quote from Wordsworth, very heaven. Unfortunately, I, I had the bliss, but I didn't have the very <laughs> heaven. <laughs> I still had a little bit of it left. Well, we'll now turn to questions from the audience. Uh, some of the handwriting is a little tricky, but I'll make the best of it. How can you, one of our questioners asks, how can you call the culture liberal today in view of the conservative majority in the country other than in large cities? Well, that's, that's, uh, the answer to that question is very simple. Um, the, the, the culture uh, is not determined by numbers, by votes. Uh, I think it's true that the majority of Americans are roughly conservative, and uh, it's one of the reasons I believe that when the dust settles, George Bush will win this election quite decisively. But, um, but uh, the culture uh, is not uh, subject to that kind of referendum of nose counting, nor should it be, by the way. The culture is determined by the major institutions uh, that are engaged in and shape it, uh, the, uh, the world of ideas, uh, which means universities, publications, the world of the arts, the world of entertainment, that's what we mean by culture. And that world is overwhelmingly not just liberal, but to some, in, in some of its, um, in some of its uh, um, parts, some parts of that forest, radical. And yet, I'll add to, to our question or follow-up, we are, I think, seeing, if not necessarily a sea change, then at least something of a breakdown in the previous cultural monopoly that these ideas once held. Well, there is, fortunately, there is a breakdown in that monopoly, and uh, and um, this uh, this was not achieved sort of uh, out of nowhere. I mean, some of us have been fighting like mad for the last 25, 30 years to break that monopoly, and we made some progress, but we remain uh, within the within the world within the culture, within the world of ideas, we, we remain a minority. Now, nothing is forever, and it's entirely possible that uh, this balance will shift. I mean, it's not written, uh, you know, in, uh, in the tablets brought down from Sinai that the uh, cultures always have to be radical. A lot of people think they do, uh, but there have been periods when there have been great, you know, uh, periods of great artistic efflorescence that were uh, that ratified as you might say the society around them and celebrated it uh, it's, it's not true that, uh, that that the arts and the philosophers and so on have always been dissidents and you could see that happening again again I doubt I'll live to see it but it's not inconceivable that it might might develop mm. now this is a question I myself thought to ask you but suspected that somebody would do for me and they have how has being Jewish affected your thoughts on the culture? 
You know, I've always had found it difficult to answer that question because for me, being Jewish is like being, I don't know, male or uh, uh, five foot six or, I mean, uh, it's so inescapably a part of who I am that I find it difficult to, you know, to sort of step back from it and say, well, you know, it has this effect or that effect. I am... Uh, um, I suppose, I mean, you know, you could ask anybody, how is being French or, or a Catholic, I don't know what affected your thinking. Um, in my case, uh, I, I don't, I, I mean, I, I have, uh, <laughs> oh dear. Um, I knew um, that would be a good question. I, I, I wrote a book, uh, which came out a year or so ago called The Prophets, Who They Were, What They Are, in which I tried to, uh, after a careful study of the prophetic literature of the Hebrew Bible, I uh, then tried to say what I thought the prophets uh, still had to say to us today. And I was accused by a lot of people of turning them into neoconservatives. Uh, my response to that was, well, if you know everybody else can turn them into liberals, I don't see why I can't turn them into, they certainly weren't liberals, whatever, whatever else they were. Um, and my own, my own uh, view, not just of the culture, but of life, uh, I think uh, uh, may very well have been determined by um, my Jewishness, uh, at least the kind of Jewish education I got. I hesitate to say that because so many Jews to have the opposite view of life, and they too are Jews. I mean, so uh, I can't attribute uh, certain things to Jewishness. You know that uh, you don't have a unified field. Theory I don't have a Judaism. unified field theory, but well, field theory. But what I what I what I can say um, uh, is that um, I, I I believe that there is a nature of things, a nature of things. Uh, that uh, uh, there's another way of uh, people call this natural law thinking. I mean, but I think that the universe uh, is governed by physical laws and it is also governed by moral laws. The difference being that uh, you can't break physical laws whereas you are free uh, to break moral laws. Uh, that's inherent in the uh, doctrine of free will. I believe in the, in the truth of that way of looking at life, uh, which is spelled out both explicitly and in uh, immensely powerful terms in the first chapters of the book of Genesis, um, and reaffirmed and reiterated throughout uh, the, uh, the, the Hebrew Bible, and, uh, and again, very wonderfully put in some of the greatest poetry ever written by the, by the prophets uh, of later uh, centuries. Uh, that there is a nature of things, that there is a moral law. Uh, now, George Bush, who was not, when I last looked, Jewish, uh, uh, would agree with this statement, and so would a lot of Catholics. Uh, so I, there's nothing distinctively Jewish about it. But the Jews, that is to say the ancient Israelites, uh, it's an anachronism to call them Jews, invented, uh, discovered, if you like, this principle, um, uh, this unified field theory of life. Um, because by definition, paganism, uh, polytheism takes the uh, another view. There are many gods. There are many. Uh, there are many laws. Um, uh, there are many. They are. They are inherently relativistic. In other words, uh, if you believe that there is one God, um, then there must be one law governing all of life, and um, therefore there are such things as absolutes. There is good. There is evil. Um, these are, um, of course, uh, uh, ideas that are anathema to the liberal culture of our day. Uh, I think one of the reasons George Bush is hated so much by liberals, only one of the reasons is that he openly professes a, a belief and acts on a belief in knowing the difference between good and evil. Um, but since so many Jews are among the liberals who reject this view, I, I, I can't say that, at least as a sort of empirical sociological observation, that it's a Jewish thing. Uh, 
I mean, I believe that it is, that is classically speaking, but it's not something you would associate with most Jews in America today, mm. this point of view, I mean. Now, we hear from someone who approaches from a different direction the question we asked a couple of moments ago about the so-called conservative majority. This person asks, how can we counter the trashing of our society by hate radio? and the negativism of cable TV, right-wing cable TV, he says. Well, I hadn't noticed that the right-wing is trashing our society. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, the questioner has, I mean, is using words in an opposite way from the way I would, I mean, I think the people who are trashing the society are on the left, not on the right. The right is usually accused of uh, excessive, uh, you know, um, uh, patriotism, chauvinism, xenophobia. And uh, that would be, a, a, you know, I think a more accurate charge if you wanted to charge the right with it, including me. I mean, my love affair with America. Um, I think that you counter the trashing of this society and you, uh, with the celebration of this society. And again, I mean something serious by the word celebration. Uh, in my book, uh, by the way, the, the reader cuts off at the year 2000 uh, and... Uh, I've written, I've published three books since then, and they're not, uh, and many essays, and they're not included, uh, they're not sampled in the reader. Uh, one of those books is, uh, I've referred to before, is My Love Affair with America, uh, in which I argue, uh, again, using my own experience uh, as an auto case history. But I, I argue, and, and I argue in, with statistics and comparative historical examples, that uh, this country is one of the great civilizations uh, known to human history. Uh, and I try to establish, I believe that to be true. Uh, you wouldn't know it from most of what you hear, and certainly kids are not taught this in school anymore, or if they ever, well, they were once upon a time, I suppose. But we have a claim to being one of the great uh, human achievements as a society in that um, this is a country that has provided more freedom and more prosperity for more people than any collectivity known to human history. It's an immense achievement, an immense achievement. Um, and uh, it is not often enough celebrated, and nor are people grateful for the blessings that are bestowed uh, through this achievement, uh, which I think uh, is, a, is, a, is a spiritual failing and a deprivation to those who do not engage in the celebration. So that's how you counter it. You counter the trashing uh, by telling what I consider to be the simple truth, which is that this is a society that deserves to be not only defended, but, but affirmed and celebrated, uh, not trashed. Mm. Let, let me, if, if I may, explore a, a different facet of what I think the previous questioner may have been getting at. You and I are sitting here and having a civilized conversation for an hour or so, inviting questions from a civilized audience, and we're not in a hurry, and we're really able to talk about things. Most of the public discourse that takes place in the electronic media now takes place on very different terms. It takes place in, in very brief sound bites uh, delivered by people who either memorize what they're going to say or couch what they want to say in a way intended to attract attention and make noise. Do you think that's contributing to the state of our society, regardless of which side of the political spectrum it may come from? Well, it's certainly not uh, commendable or healthy. I mean, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure exactly what to do about it or, how, or whether anything can be done about it. Um, uh, but certainly, um, you know, the, the, the earnest demand that we discuss the issues, uh, well, let a politician make a speech uh, giving a 10-point program about uh, tax reform or health care, and everybody falls asleep. I mean, they know that. They'll issue, dutifully issue position papers that nobody reads, um, and nobody should read, by the way, since they're not intended seriously. They're like platforms of parties. Um, I mean, I, I'll s shift gears for a minute and express some compassion for, for people who run for political office. It's not a common thing for me to do, but truth is that it's very, very hard 
very, very hard to capture the attention and the support of several hundred million people. Um, it's not something I've ever had to do. <laughs> and if I try to do it, I of course, would, of course, fail dismally. It's a, hard, it's a hard job that those people are engaged in. Uh, it's, uh, by the way, I would say the same thing about the purveyors of mass culture, uh, the much abused uh, Hollywood moguls. I mean, people who need in order like to break even on an investment, you know, to, to sell a hundred million tickets or whatever it is. It's a very, very hard thing to do, as we know. Uh, <clears throat> and it leads to all kinds of uh, unlovely um, uh, activities in pursuit of that objective. Again, I'm not sure what, if anything, can be done about it. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, and you have first-hand experience of this, we now see the, uh, the birth, we're sitting at, at the, uh, at the, we're present at the creation of a whole new form of extended communication, uh, the blogs, uh, the blogosphere, Terry Teachout has one of these himself. Uh, if you surf online, uh, there are these people who are writing 24 hours a day, some of it garbage, some of it quite good. Um, but all of it uh, is certainly uh, you know, lengthy. They're not sound bites. There's a lot of fighting going back and forth. Uh, people are uh, the, they are policing one another. They catch the New York Times in uh, little acts of dishonesty, or they catch each other in law. I mean, uh, this is something that never existed uh, until what two years ago something About like that It's ago. a brand. We don't know what's going to happen I mean, we're we really are at the birth of a new era in, in, in this world of uh, uh, I mean the sound I, who knows there may they're gonna have a, a profound effect certainly on newspapers uh, I think you yourself suggested that newspapers may die and I think that is likely true uh, as a result of the of the internet, uh, but also uh, television is going to be radically affected, uh, well, by interactive technologies and so on. So the the whole the world of the soundbite and the uh, and the demagogic appeal uh, may itself uh, be transformed by these new developments. I don't know, but it's 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 a very interesting moment to 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 watch. From your mouth to God's ear. <laughs> Uh, now pitching from right field, speaking of the New York Times, how do you explain that otherwise intelligent people buy the New York Times? <laughs> well, um, I can answer, I, there are two ways to answer that question. One of them is to say that, um, that um, uh, the people who buy the New York Times and read it uh, are in the literal sense probably quite intelligent, I mean, have relatively high IQs or however you want to measure intelligence. That's not what's wrong with them, in my opinion. Um, the, um, but I mean, I buy the New York Times. I used to read it from cover to cover because it was sort of like homework, you know, grimly have to read it to know what's going on. It's, it's like a community bulletin board and the community is by now national. I mean, you, uh, the Times is like when you were in the army. I remember every day you had to read the bulletin for the orders of the day and people get, get their marching orders explicit or implicit from reading the Times every day. That it's is, they the house are, organ of blue America. Yeah, well, the house organ, yeah, of the conventional liberal wisdom. That's what it is. And uh, this, is, um, this is where you find out uh, what you're supposed to think if you're a member of that community and don't wish to, um, don't wish to commit heresy or apostasy. Um, so the, the issue is not so much intelligence. The issue is attitude. and. Uh, and um, prior conviction. Oh, that's a, not a bad pun, actually. No, it's not. <clears throat> now, we have a question on the subject of not just the moment, but the instant. The questioner asks, don't you believe Abe Foxman and the rest of Jewish leaders overreacted and should have just ignored Mel Gibson's movie? Well, I don't know whether they should. I mean, uh, we'll see whether they overreacted. Uh, the uh, have I have you, have you seen it? I was no, I have not it. seen it, and uh, uh, you can't. Um, it's hard to know whether whether or not they overreacted. The difficulty with that movie, uh, uh, 
I'll know better when I've seen it, but I've read more than I would like to have done about it. Uh, the, 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 the difficulty is that coming at this particular moment when uh, anti-Semitism is on the rise, um, it was inevitable that it would, uh, would lift a stone uh, uh, from beneath which some ugly stuff might emerge. In other words, <clears throat> the whole issue of did the Jews kill Jesus, uh, which was sort of a quiet, settled more or less um, for a long time, is now back uh, in, into public discussion. This cannot be good for the Jews, by the way, I mean, uh, in my opinion. So to that extent, uh, maybe it would have been prudent to ignore it, but uh, I can understand why it was not ignored. Um, the, the, um, the issue, you know, there's a, a joke I used to know um, about a guy who comes into a bar, a Jew comes into an Irish bar and uh, uh, sitting next to this drunk uh, who, uh, I won't go through the whole joke, who discovers that he's a Jew, and uh, he socks him. And the, the Jewish guy says, what, what, what did you hit me for? He said, because you killed Christ. And the Jew says, yeah, but that happened 2,000 years ago. And the Irishman says, yeah, but I only just heard about it yesterday. <laughs> you see, uh, well, that's my anxiety about the Mel Gibson movie, um, uh, that it will bring this, this whole issue uh, in, into public dispute again. I mean, even arguing about it is bad. Um, I mean, most of the churches uh, have, you know, came, uh, I must say, with some difficulty because the uh, plain text of the Gospels does feed this idea and did feed it for, you know, uh, at least uh, nearly 2,000 years, um, came to the conclusion that this is not what the uh, Gospels mean, uh, that we all killed Christ, Christ died for our sins, it wasn't the Jews, etc., etc. Et so um, that's been the uh, sort of official position of the Catholic Church and many of the Protestant churches. They don't, of course, have an official position, but that's been the agreed-upon interpretation. Uh, which is good for the Jews and good for, for interreligious uh, relations. Um, and the fear is that uh, Gibson's movie will undermine that settled um, uh, idea about the crucifixion. Uh, and we'll see. While we're on the subject of what's good for the Jews, we have this question. How do you evaluate the two Johns, Carrie and Edwards, particularly with respect to Israel? And what about Ralph Nader? I don't know what Carrie and Edwards uh, think about Israel, uh, I'll tell you the truth. I mean, I, I've seen conflicting stuff. I'm sure they'll make all the right noises. Uh, it's not all that interesting. Uh, what I think about, I mean, I think John Edwards, who is obviously very good looking and pleasant and so on, has a literally demented idea about this country. He talks about it. Um, to quote something uh, my son, John Podhoritz, uh, who's just got a new book out of, called Bush Country, which I commend to all of you. Um, Although it's uh, not on sale, I'm afraid. Not out here, yeah. <laughs> it's in, in your local bookstore. Um, uh, uh, but it said that he, he talks about this country as though it were 1932, uh, and uh, which is simply crazy. I mean, the two Americas. Um, uh, as for Kerry, uh, I, I, I have to, well, another book I wrote a long time ago, which is sampled in the reader, which is a book called Why We Were in Vietnam. That was one of the um, penitent works I, I, um, I undertook, having been an early opponent of that war. I wrote a, a, a whole new take on it, and uh, I think it was in the early 80s. Anyway, um, uh, in the course of doing research for that book, I got to know I, I, something about the uh, Vietnam veterans against the war, whom I, of whom I had been vaguely aware when I was a member of the anti-war movement myself, and particularly Kerry's role in, uh, in defaming the, uh, uh, the troops 
in Vietnam, and I conceived a great dislike of him, despite his heroism under in, under fire, uh, for the things he said, uh, which I knew to be untrue. I mean, there was an investigation of those charges, uh, uh, which turned out uh, the, nobody nobody could be found to confirm them, and uh, he has not, uh, incidentally, uh, repented of them or repudiated them. So I, uh, my attitude toward him is very much colored by uh, uh, long before you know he was a senator or ran for president, um, and I think Edwards is just silly. I mean, although very attractive, <laughs> as silly people are wont to be. The questioner asks, "Do you think America will be more statist or less statist in the next twenty years?" Mm, that's a very very interesting question. Statist. Statist. Well, the secular trend is toward bigger and bigger government. I mean, Bill, Bill Crystal, uh, Bill Crystal, Bill Clinton, famous, <laughs> famous. Uh, One's you know, pretty, the other yeah. isn't. Uh, Bill Clinton once famously declared the era of big government is over, but uh, he was wrong. Uh, the era of big government is not only not over, but it's gotten even bigger under a conservative Republican president, namely George W. Bush. Um, what uh, what uh, statisticians or associate, whoever it is who makes these predictions call the secular trend is almost inexorably toward bigger and bigger government because there is a demand, and that includes uh, among you know most people who would regard themselves as conservatives, for the government to do more and more things um, and to s try to solve more and more problems. Um, uh, this is uh, a, um, as many thinkers uh, long before our time warned, is a dangerous development uh, uh, and uh, and, right, and understandably and, uh, and uh, heroically, uh, there are people who've been trying to fight um, in the name of more limited government against the inexorable expansion of state power. But it's a, it's a, it's a rear guard battle and, and probably a losing one, except to the extent that it might put something of a break on this development. Because if it does go too far, you do really find yourself, we will, would find ourselves in a, if not totalitarian society, certainly one in which there would be far less freedom um, than we enjoy now. Now, this is one of the ones with tricky handwriting, but it's a good question, and I think I can manage it. Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message. Mm -hmm. What role do you believe TV played in disseminating the counterculture of the 60s, as well as the, I have trouble with this, the anti-Vietnam oppression of the 60s. Yeah, well, t the TV had a, had a lot to do with it, uh, no question about that, uh, but uh, less than you might think, uh, because uh, uh, TV, TV didn't really uh, line up, in a sense, behind the radical movement until the late 60s, and um, uh, particularly when Walter Cronkite, for example, uh, after the Tet Offensive decided that we had lost the war and had to get out, even though the Tet Offensive was actually a victory for us, not a defeat. But, uh, but there's no question that the, uh, that, the, that the major media slowly, gra again, I have to back up. Uh, most people are surprised to hear that uh, for the first few years of the Vietnam War, the New York Times and the Washington Post were supported it and said things like, it's unthinkable for us to get out. Um, it was only later that the conversion of the liberal establishment to the radical point of view materialized, and it was a fairly gradual process. Um, but once it did, uh, uh, it's, it, it kept marching in that direction, and uh, there's no doubt that um, it's not just television and the major media, also the movies, uh, uh, the theater, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the visual arts. I mean, everything uh, has been, uh, has been uh, pushing that uh, gender, maybe too, too formal a word, but that point of view uh, since, I would say, the mid-70s. Mm -hmm. 
And that continues to be the case, except again, uh, as Terry mentioned before, the monopoly has been broken. And uh, so you see something like Fox News, which has broken the monopoly uh, in, uh, among news uh, uh, channels. Uh, and you see other uh, signs of, uh, of a countervailing force uh, developing uh, within the culture. But uh, it's still a, it's, it's a long, hard slog. Mm. We have time for one more question. I thought of asking this. I'm glad I didn't, because the questioner has asked it in a better way than I had in mind. This person asks, who are the intellectuals who most inspired you, not influenced, inspired? Well, I, I was, uh, I'm not sure I know the difference between influenced and inspired. Um, when I was young, uh, I, what I wanted, I wanted above all to, uh, well, I began by wanting to be a great poet. And by the time I was a sophomore in college, I discovered that I was not even a good poet. Uh, so uh, my ambition reluctantly shifted in a different direction. Uh, but what I, what, I, what I was inspired by, the example I was inspired by, uh, was the, 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 the type of literary intellectual who was very prominent in, in those years. I'm now talking about the late 40s, early 50s, among whom was Lionel Trilling, who happened to be, uh, become a teacher of mine and later a friend and, uh, and a teacher of mine at Columbia. And, uh, and later a friend, uh, Trilling was, a, uh, was one of the leading New York literary intellectuals. Uh, there were a whole bunch of them, many of whom I talk about in my book, Ex-Friends. Um, and uh, I, at that stage of my life, I was inspired by their example. What was their example? They seemed to know everything, to have read everything. They were all very brilliant. Uh, and uh, they were all, um, uh, they, were, they were not only brilliant, but they, they were all, uh, how should I put it, non unpretentious. I mean, they were funny. They were a lot of fun. Um, was, That's something we don't get in the, the received account, you know, the yeah. fun part. Yeah, oh, well, there was, a, there was enormous fun, very malicious. Uh, that was part of the fun, all the malicious gossip. Um, I tried to describe a lot of that in, in Ex Friends, um, and uh, that's what I wanted to be, as it were, when I grew up, uh, and that's what I became. But I also discovered, as I tried to describe in great detail in Ex Friends, uh, gradually, that uh, there was a dark side to this this world, this intellectual world that was otherwise so glittering. And the dark side was uh, uh, was some of its uh, attitudes, particularly toward this country. Uh, but I, I, that's a difficult one to answer. Sort of as we're rushing toward a conclusion, uh, I, I uh, uh, well, I, I found that that my 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 world, the world that has in, had inspired me, uh, was capable with all the brilliance and the, and no question about the brilliance and the learning, the erudition was capable of being wrong about some of the most elementary and important things. I mean, one great example was Hannah Arendt, uh, who uh, I, I wrote an essay, what's in the reader? It's called Hannah Arendt on Eichmann, um, uh, something, a study in the, in the perversity of brilliance, which was a play on her, uh, the, the title, the subtitle of her book on Eichmann, which was the banal, study in the banality of evil. And uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, who was a uh, friend of mine, uh, was uh, probably uh, as brilliant a person as I've ever known in my life. And she turned out to be wrong about practically everything, s small and large. Uh, it was a great lesson for me to learn. But uh, she did, at one stage of her life, write what I thought Maybe I wouldn't think so if I reread it today. What I thought was a great book, that is, The Origins of Totalitarianism. All these people, they were, they were, the, they were certainly an inspiration. Uh, and, um, and I have lived my life pretty much, my intellectual life pretty much in that tradition, even though I found myself becoming a rebel against most of its leading ideas in, in due course. Norman, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you all.
And now, you buy it, he'll sign it out there. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org. 